All right, 2 Samuel chapter 20, just keep your place there and we'll get to that in a minute. So did you all take the personality test is the question. So I, I've been asking some of you, um, most of you have taken it. I've been asking what you, what you are. My wife will probably be asking the ladies um, what you are. I'll tell you a little bit why um, later. But, um, you know, we've got a lot of results back. From, I think most of the people in the church have taken it so far. So let me ask you um, this. So first of all, Joab. You know, what was Joab? Joab was an ENJT, or as the personality test would say, Joab was a commander. Okay? So who in here um, took the personality test and had it come out that they were a commander? Can we get a show of hands? Nobody, right? Because there's not that many. They're like 2 to 3% of the population, and for good reason, actually. So um, the personality test, we'll get into like what that means for you, and we're going to have a sermon series on the personality test coming on, you know, in the next few weeks. But basically, um, Joab is a perfect example. And you say, oh, commander, that sounds really cool, man. I want to be that one. Well, if you look at the disadvantages and advantages of a lot of the personality tests, I'm sure you went and you looked at the advantages first of your personality that it came out. And then you look at the disadvantages of them. Um, some of them didn't have many disadvantages, like the defenders. It's like, oh, you're too nice, you know, who, you know, there, there's a real disadvantage, right? You're too nice to people, and, you know, you're too, you're too feeling, and you're too caring to people, and it's like, oh, that's a real disadvantage, right? But there's a lot of disadvantages to the commander personality, and Joab is a perfect example of an unchecked commander, of an unchecked commander. If you look at the disadvantages, which we talked about last week, if you look at the disadvantages of the commander, you'll read it, and I'm going to read some of them for you towards the end of the sermon this evening, but you're going to be like, if you know the stories of Joab in the Bible, you're going to be like, oh yeah, that fits perfectly into what Joab was. So he was a commander. Let's look at, um, but there, there's some good things about the commander personality, and that's what I want to talk to you about um, for about half the sermon tonight, is the good things of Joab. And you've probably never heard a good a, a sermon on Joab, you know, the good traits of Joab, but you're going to hear one, at least half of one, this evening. So let's talk about the good traits of Joab. So first let me read you um, the good traits of a commander personality. Commanders are natural born leaders. That certainly fits Joab. People with this personality type embody the gifts of charisma and confidence and project authority in a way that draws crowds together behind a common goal. You know, there, there's a lot, I mean, there, this story in 2 Samuel chapter 20, you'll notice that there was people following Joab, that there was people, even when he murdered a guy, people still followed Joab. Okay, so he was able to get people to crowd around him and follow him. However, commanders are also characterized by an often ruthless level of rationality. Does that sound like Joab or what? Using their drive, determination, and sharp minds to achieve whatever end they've set for themselves. If this, I mean, perhaps it's best that they make up only 3% of the population, it says, lest they overwhelm the more sensitive personality types that make up much of the rest of the world. We have commanders to thank for many great businesses and institutions we take for granted every day. So the disadvantages we'll talk about later, but basically this, I mean, that's a lot like Joab. So first of all, the advantages, here's one of the specific advantage bullet points, is they're efficient, okay? Remember Amasa. So Amasa gets killed in 2 Samuel chapter 20, but look, you know, Joab, all he was doing by killing Amasa in his own mind was he was rooting out inefficiencies in his own immoral way, is what he was doing. So commanders see inefficiency not just as a problem in its own right, but as something that pulls time and energy away from all their future goals. An elaborate sabotage consisting of irrationality and laziness. So they hate irrational people and laziness. People with the commander personality type will root out such behavior wherever they go. And that's exactly what Joab did with Amasa in, you know, Amasa was late. He was rooting out the inefficiencies, you know, by murdering him. That was, that was Joab's. Um, so first of all, the, let me give you a, a positive thing about Joab. It's, it's this. He was efficient and effective. Joab was efficient and effective. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 20 if you're not there already. Look at verse number 6. So what do we remember happened here? So Amasa was charged with raising an army. Absalom has just been put down. That, that, that coup is over. And now David comes back, and this Sheba son of Bichri starts another 
coup attempt. He starts another rebellion, and David just, he just had it with this. And he sends Amasa, his new general, by the way, which is interesting. We'll get to that in a minute. He sends Amasa out to raise an army. He gives him three days to do it, and he takes longer than three days. He's late. Look at verse number six. And David said to Abishai, now, so now he sees that Amasa has not come back in time. Now David said to Abishai, which is Joab's brother, by the way, now shall Sheba, the son of Bichri, do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get him fenced cities and escape us. And there went out after him Joab's men and the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men. So here's, here's all these mighty men and all these warriors going and they're following Joab. Once again, they're just following him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. Look down at verse number 16. So Joab, he leads, he leads this charge. He's not, the, he's not the general in charge anymore, by the way. Amasa was the general in charge, but Joab just gathers everybody together with Abishai, and they go out and they take all the mighty men and they go after this guy. And then let me show you uh, verse 16. Then, of course, he kills Amasa, and everyone's just standing there. They're like, oh, man, that's the, the general. He's dead right there. And they're like, throw him in the ditch. Let's go. And they throw him in the ditch, and they, they all follow Joab after that. And look at verse 16. So now Shiva has gone into a city. He's gone into a city, into a walled city, just what David was fearing, and he's hiding there. And Joab and his army, his men, get to the wall of the city, and then this happens. Then cried a wise woman out of the city, Hear, hear, say, I pray you unto Joab, come near hither, that I may speak with thee. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then she said unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. So she knew who Joab was. And she knew what was about to happen. And that was what gave this woman. That's all it took for this woman to be wise. And for this woman to have wisdom. Is just to know who Joab was and what he was going to accomplish. She knew who he was. She's like, are you Joab? She knew exactly who Joab was. Then she spake, saying, They won't speak in old time. There, there were want to speak in old time, saying, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel. And so they ended the matter. I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said, Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. The matter is not so. But a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri, by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said unto Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown over thee to, the wall, to thee over the wall. Then the woman went out to all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. What do you think she said to those people? What do you think she said to those people? So they, I mean, she goes in. It doesn't it sound like there was a huge debate here. Maybe there was. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city. Every man to his tent, and Joab returned to Jerusalem unto the king. So what do you think she went and said to those people? You think she went and said, yeah, there's this guy. He's outside. He's got this band of men, and I don't know. I don't know who he is or whatever. No, she went in there and said, Joab's outside. And if we don't give up this guy, he's going to kill us all. That's what she said. And it wasn't a long debate, and they cut the guy's head off, and they threw it over the wall. Because they knew who Joab was, and they knew what he was going to do. Because he was, he was effective, and he was efficient at whatever he put his mind to do. Okay, look, and Joab didn't put his mind to do much good. But the point is, when he set his mind to do something, it got done. It got done. So Joab knew how to get things done, and people knew who he was. I mean, think about all the military victories of Joab. Look, David just knew that Joab could, deli to de could deliver a W. That's, that's what David knew about Joab. He knew that when he needed a victory, that Joab could bring it through. And look, to many leaders, to kings, to leaders of companies, that guy's really valuable. They just sometimes, I mean, morality aside... A guy that you can just give a task to and you know it will just get done, that's a super valuable person. I mean, having somebody in your organization that can deliver a win against all odds is huge. I mean, all of you business owners in there, imagine if you had a, a, a company full of people that you just, you just gave them tasks to do 
and they just, you knew that it would get done. I mean, it's very valuable. And sometimes you just need a win. But you could tell, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 19, one chapter back, you could tell, now Joab, like I said, he was an unchecked commander. He was, he was efficient. He was effective. Morality didn't have much to play in there. What the Bible said, what God wanted, didn't have much to play in Joab's life. But when he set his mind to do something, it got done. You cannot argue that. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 19. David, you could tell that David was trying to find ways to reduce Joab's influence as David got older and as his, as his kingdom and his life neared an end. He was trying to find ways to reduce the influence of Joab. And 2 Samuel 19 gives us one of those ways. Look at verse 13. So Amasa was Absalom's general. Amasa was the general to the son that rebelled against David. And David comes back after the victory and he makes Amasa his general. Look at verse 13. And say ye to Amasa, Art thou not of my bone and of my flesh? God's, they're cousins. God do so to me and more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. He gave Amasa Joab's job of the king of the army. He tried, he tried to replace Joab. He tried to replace Joab with Amasa. He was trying to remove the influence of this man, of this man that was just running over everybody, doing what he wanted, just, you know, in an efficient and effective way, for sure, but just, he was trying to reduce him. But here's the thing, Amasa couldn't fill the shoes. Amasa couldn't fill the shoes. Here they had a, a moral thing to do to try to put this rebellion down, and Amasa couldn't get it done. And Joab proves once again, he steps right in. Of course, he kills Amasa, but he steps right in, and he comes back, and he tells the king, it's done. He gets the job done that Amasa couldn't do. Look, I mean, it's hard finding reliable people. And, and you know, as a leader, you know, people that can just get things done are a necessity. You know, the next time, you know, the next chapter, the uprising occurs, of course, we just saw it. But we see that's one good thing about Joab was he was a reliable and he was efficient and he was effective for the king in many scenarios. The next thing, Joab, turn to 2 Samuel 19, verse number 1. Joab was, and this is another characteristic of the commander personality, he was, he was not a yes man. He was somebody who was very strong-willed and he was a truthful counselor to David. He was a truthful counselor to David. And not a lot of people will be a truthful counselor, especially when, and I'm not saying he actually did it you know, the right way and the way that you should give counsel, but he was a truthful counselor to David. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 19. So here... Joab has just murdered Absalom against the king's will. Once again, we talked about that last week. But he's gone against the king's will and he's killed Absalom. But the people, Joab and Abishai and Ittai, they have won the battle for King David. They have won the kingdom back for him. And here, David finds out that Absalom is dead and he's weeping for his son. He's weeping, he's crying for his son. And Joab, you know rebukes him in not a respectful way, but look at, and it was told Joab, verse number one, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people heard say that that day the king was grieved for his son. And the people got them by, this, by stealth that day into the city, as people being ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. So here, what this says in verse number three is that what you had was this, this great, wonderful victory was turned into a negative thing for these people. And the people that had just been out fighting, that had just been out fighting for David to regain the kingdom, they were sneaking back into the city. They were covering their heads and they, because they didn't want to seem, you know, happy or when the king was sad. Okay, so... But the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And Joab came into the house to the king and said, Thou hast shamed this day all the faces of all thy servants, which they, this day have saved thy life, and the lives of thy sons and thy daughters, and the lives of thy wives, and the lives of thy concubines. And that thou lovest thine, 
in that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither prince nor servant, servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and we had all died this day, then it had pleased thee well. So Joab, now therefore arise, go forth and speak comfortably, verse 7, unto thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night, and that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befall thee from thy youth until now. So first of all, this is good advice given in a bad way. This is good counsel given in a bad way. He, Joab is upset. He's mad and he's just, he's going up to David and he's like, look, he's like, you're pretending like you hate all your friends. You're pretending like, I mean, imagine how many of these people must have died in the battle. I mean, whenever you have a battle and one side wins and one side loses, both sides lose soldiers, especially hand-to-hand -hand combat like we're talking about here. Um, I mean, dozens, hundreds, who knows, maybe even thousands of people of David's people died this day and David is mourning for the enemy the leader of the enemy. And that's what Joab is bringing up to him. And I'm not saying Joab was not respectful here, okay? But he was telling him what he needed to hear, in, albeit in a not, not in the right way, okay? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look, it, it's much, I mean, it's much better if you're going to give advice to be direct. I mean, you should be respectful, but it's better to be re direct than to be ambiguous and to be, you know, say things that are gray and people may misunderstand one way or another. It would have been okay for Joab to just say, hey, uh, King David, um, I think this might be perceived the wrong way. I'm sorry for your loss. You know, Joab couldn't really say that because he killed the guy. But, I mean, you know, it, it, I'm sorry for your loss, but hey, I think you're risking some things here. People might take it the wrong way. That would be a more sensitive way to give him the same advice. But the point is, at least Joab said something because many people would never approach a leader or never approach the king with any kind of advice at all. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. The Bible says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. So, I mean, Joab kind of rebuked David here. So that was his, his advice. But, look, he did give advice on another occasion that was in a better way. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24. So once again, we see that he's strong-willed. And this is another thing, another attribute of commanders. They, they have very strong opinions. They have very strong opinions, and they will make those opinions known. So if you took the personality test, you know, there was, I don't know, what was it, one through five for, I feel very strongly about this, or I don't feel strongly at all. And then there was all these things in the middle, right? If you, the commander, if Joab were to take that test, he would have ones and fives. That's all he would have. He wouldn't have any twos, he wouldn't have any threes, he wouldn't have any fours. It's all one or five. And he would be done with the test faster than anyone in the room, guaranteed. Because it's just like, oh yeah, one, five, five, one, 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 five, 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 one, one, done. That's it. That's how Joab would take that test. He's very strong-willed and, and they will make their opinions known. And this helped David, this helped David um, to a degree. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 24. David didn't always listen. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 2. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan, Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. So Joab, or David is going to do something that's wrong here. He's going to go and he's going to take a census of the people, and he's going to get himself in a lot of trouble. And Joab is the one that stands up and says, hey, why are, why are you going to do this? You should think about this. Look at verse 3. And Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord thy God add unto thy people. By the way, that's why it's wrong. You ever wonder why, oh, why did God get so mad when David took the census? Because David was showing a, a lack of faith. David was showing a lack of of faith in God because God told the children of Israel again and again and again and again in the Bible that I will, you will prosper through me. You will prosper through me. Just kind of like this church will, go through, will grow through the Lord. We will, you know, there's nothing that we can do to just drag people in here. And you know, that's the problem with the church growth movement is they just focus on, hey, what can we do? Let's start a, let's start a, a, a cartoon class or a puppet show and get some kids in here. You know, and we'll, we'll do all these goofy things and we'll serve ice cream and, and whatever and, and, you know, stand outside with signs or I don't know what churches do. But here's what we do. We do what we're supposed to do and the Lord will grow the church. And we just have that faith that the Lord will grow the church. 
But look, David was going to number the people because he just wanted to know how many people he had, and that was showing a lack of faith in God. And Joab warns him here. He says, Now the Lord thy God add unto the people, how many soever they be, and hundredfold, and the eyes of my Lord the king may see it. But why doth my Lord the king delight in this thing? And I mean, look, God doesn't even want you, you know, having, that's another thing. God will grow the people, but also he wants your faith in him because God doesn't need people. God doesn't need massive numbers. Remember Gideon? He's like, send them home. Send more home. Send more home. To the point where there's only 300 left against tens of thousands of people in the other army. And, and why was it? Because the God said, I want you to know that the victory was mine and not yours. So God doesn't need the numbers. And He will grow the numbers if He chooses to grow the numbers. So it's just a complete lack of faith on David's side. But it was Joab that told him. And of course, we know the rest of the story. He does it anyway. But the point I'm trying to make is, Joab was not a yes man. He was strong-willed. He was effective. He was efficient. And he was driven. These are all good things on their face. The problem in Joab's life was that the good things can be outweighed by character flaws. Look, the personality test, it does not, the personality test, it does not define your character. That personality test that you took and you read those advantages and those disadvantages, that's not your character. Those are your tendencies. I mean, think about the personality test for Joab. He's strong-willed, but what was he, but he was strong-willed towards selfish goals. I mean, he's effective. I mean, he's extremely effective. Most of the things that he was effective in was doing evil. But he was effective. I mean, the thing is just dead on when it describes Joab. He was efficient. He was extremely efficient. Most of the time, he was efficient at pushing his own agenda and not David's agenda, especially not God's agenda. So he was efficient, for sure. I mean, he was driven towards the wrong things. He was driven towards the wrong things. The personality test does not reflect your character. So don't be depressed. So when I told my wife the results of my personality test and she read the, dis you know, hey, don't be depressed. <laughs> don't be depressed. It shows your strengths and your weaknesses. That, that's what it does. But you must apply the Bible on top of that. So we're going to have an upcoming sermon series on the top three to four um, personalities in the church. And that's going to be, uh, that's going to be sporty. So, Joab's weaknesses. Now let's look at the weaknesses according to the personality test. And I didn't want to give this away until the end of the sermon last week. But basically, this is the commander weaknesses. Now, now, just tell me if this sounds like Joab, if you know the stories of Joab in the Bible. Stubborn and dominant. Sometimes all the confidence and willpower can go too far. And commanders are all too capable of digging in their heels, trying to win every single you know, debate and pushing their vision and theirs alone. They're intolerant. It's my way or the highway. People with the commander personality type are notoriously unsupportive of any idea that, distra that distracts from their primary goals. And even more so of ideas based on emotional considerations. <laughs> Sermon's over. You know what I mean? But I mean, that is so true. And that is something that you have to work on. I mean, you work on your disadvantages. Look at those disadvantages. Because, look, is that right? Is that right to just, like, disregard anybody else's feelings at all times? That's not right to do that. And it's not going to be, look, it's not going to be effective dealing with other people either. Okay, but knowing that you have tendencies towards that is extremely valuable. Joab didn't care about anybody's feelings at all. I mean, think about when he killed these people. He didn't care about how that was going to affect uh, David. He didn't affect how it was going to affect the kingdom. He didn't care about any of it. He just cared about revenge. That's what he cared about. Here's another one. Impatient. Some people need more time to think than others. And an intolerable delay to quick thinking, an intolerable delay to quick thinking is... Um, the commander's personality. They may misinterpret contemplation as stupidity or disinterest in their haste, a terrible mistake for a leader to make. So, look, you don't want to be late around a commander. 
I mean, they, they, take it, uh, you know, they take it the wrong way. Here's another one. And I, I was not even going to read this one because it's not even. They're arrogant. <laughs> Commander personalities respect quick thoughts and firm convictions, their own qualities, and look down on those who don't match up. This relationship is a challenge for most other personality types who are perhaps not timid in their own right, but will seem so beside overbearing commanders. So, I mean, this one, there's really, I mean, this one should be completely checked by the Bible because there's really nothing in the Bible that says it's good to be arrogant because the opposite of that is being humble. So, commanders need to work on humbling themselves a lot. And Joab didn't do a very good job of that. And here's another one, poor handling of emotions. All this bluster alongside the assumed supremacy of rationalism makes commanders distant from their own emotional expression and sometimes downright scornful of others. People with this personality type often trample others' feelings, inadvertently hurting their partner and friends, especially in emotionally charged situations. And then the last one, and if this doesn't describe Joab, I don't know what does, they are cold and ruthless. Their obsession with efficiency and unwavering belief in the merits of rationalism, especially professionally, makes commanders incredibly insensitive in pursuing their goals, dismissing personal circumstances, sensitivities, and preferences as irrational and irrelevant. So Joab, this is why Joab, well, look, he had no forgiveness. He had no forgiveness. He had no forgiveness at all when these things, when his brother was killed, when Absalom betrayed the kingdom. He had no forgiveness. It was just revenge. That was it. Unchecked commander. That's Joab to a T. Vengeance and revenge. I mean, he was just emotionless about killing people. Right? Look, don't leave the church, okay? The, but wait till we get to the end. All right? Look, so some good, some good we see. But completely, especially in Joab's case, completely outweighed by the bad. Because he used the advantages of who he was towards just being in the flesh, basically. What he wanted. So, the upcoming series, what the personality test means for you, is that you can look at these things, they will be very accurate to your tendencies, I'm telling you. You can look at these things, you can be aware of these disadvantages, you can watch for them, and then you can change them. But here's the trick. Years ago I took this test, okay? Let me give you an example. I had to take this test, and it was a, it was a very complicated version of this test. Hundreds and hundreds of questions. And this company that I worked for, it was a different industry. I came from an uh, industry, I came from the semiconductor industry, which was very cutthroat. And they encouraged you to be cutthroat. They encouraged you to be in a meeting with 15 people. And if somebody said the wrong thing, you were encouraged to just cut them into the ground and just basically call them an idiot in front of everybody. Because they didn't want stupid ideas. Okay, I was in my 20s. I liked it. <laughs> I mean, I liked it. I'm like, this is good. We don't want dumb ideas. Okay? But I came from this type of culture of a company, and I came into a different industry, into the utility industry, and they wanted managers that were a certain way. So I took the test and, you know, way down in that quadrant down there, and they're like, okay, and, and here's the funny thing, they were correct. They were correct because they did not want leaders that would just come in and manage a project and just run over everybody. Because the first project I actually had with this company, I'll never forget it, and I, and I ended up becoming, working with these same guys for the next almost 10 years. And it, it just became a great team. But the first project I ran, I did not run well. Because what did I do? I just came in, and I was like, here's how we're doing it. And they're like, what about this? I'm like, we're going this way. Well, well, you could do this. You know, guys with 30 years experience, 40 years experience. Well, what about this? We could use this valve, or we could use this PLC, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I know what I'm doing. This is the way we're doing it. And pretty soon, I mean, we finished the project, but I was pretty much standing by myself by the time the project was done. It's not the right way to do things. It's not the right way to do things. I mean, the way that this company, they actually taught, they actually taught me to kind of put those things to the side and collaborate with people. I mean, a church is different. I'm talking about a, a work situation. But look, collaboration is a good thing. In, in, you know, there's people that have strengths and technical experience that can be used to make a better product, to make a better project. I mean, I believe in it. 
I believe in it. I didn't believe in it back then. But look, there are things that you can apply to your disadvantages in the personality test that will make you a better Christian. You can apply the Bible to your disadvantages and it'll make you a better Christian. Joab, I mean, look, Joab had some strengths, but they were wasted. They were not applied the right way. And it defined his entire life in a negative way. So the biggest key, the biggest key is this, though. The biggest key when we go into this series, and even in Joab's case, even in your case, as we listen to these sermons, and even for sermons, whatever sermons, or whatever you read in the Bible, the biggest key is this. The biggest key is the willingness to change. Is the willingness to change. I mean, you take the personality test, you go read your advantages, and you're like, yeah, I'm great. You know, and then you read your disadvantages, and you're like, okay, um, but look, here, you can successfully mitigate those disadvantages if you're just willing to change. And look, the personality test is a secular thing, and you might find that some advantages that they list are actually disadvantages when we start applying the Bible to it. So when you apply the Bible to the traits that these personalities, you know, assign to you, you might find that you might need to suppress or, you know, bring out some disadvantages or, or advantages or vice versa. But the bi bottom line is this. You have to concisely change. And that's a very difficult thing for, for most people. For most people, they kind of are who they are. And I'm learning this more and more as I get older. But that's why, and that's why, by the way, that's why secular industry and secular studies and HR groups, that's why they put so much stock in these tests. Because most people are not going to change. Most people, by the time they get to be 30 years old, by the time they get to 30 years old, or maybe even younger, they're kind of who they are. Their music is set, their, their ideas are set, and they, you know, th but look, how many times have we seen the Bible change people's lives? The Bible is not some self-help book written by, you know, whoever. The Bible is the one thing that can actually, it can, what does it do? It cuts to the heart. And if you let it, it will change you. So if you let the Bible, if you just drop, you know, I mean, this is kind of what you just have to do. You just kind of have to be the type of person that's like, well, if it's in the Bible, I'm just going to do it. There was, I, mean, I still remember. I still remember after I got saved and I started you know, reading the Bible. I mean, there was a lot of things. That I was like, yeah, I don't know. That, that's not how I was raised. You pretty much just have to realize that everything that you were taught was wrong. And just, just decide in your mind as you read the Bible, as you learn the Bible, as we preach the Bible here, that if it's in the Bible, I'm just going to believe it. And if that requires a change, even if that's an uncomfortable change in my life, I'm going to do everything that I can to do that. And then, you know, we can all, I mean, how do you think that we all, I mean, we all have the same spirit if we're saved. But we're all following, you know, the same rule book here. We're all trying to make the same changes, looking at the same goal. I mean, that's, that's how we all get along so well here. Even though we all have these different personalities. We all have these different personalities, different advantages. I mean, we're not all an arm. We're not all a leg. It kind of sounds like Paul invented the 16 personalities test. You know, we all can't be an eye or an ear. We have to have all these different things, but we do all have to be focused on what's right and what's wrong. Because you can't just have people like Joab in, in a church. I mean, look at what he did to a kingdom. You can't have people like this just running unchecked in an organization or a, a, a church. Unfortunately, Joab would probably do pretty well out in, the, out in the world. But look, if that's the reason that secular studies put so much into this. And that's why you'll hear all this stuff today. Like, I mean, how, who's heard this philosophy? Hey, you just got to be yourself. Just find out. Just find out who you are. Remember those guys out soul winning? Brother Frank, be yourself, bro. Be true to yourself, bro. That means basically take all the, the traits that you have, that you were born with, any, any fleshly desire that I have, and be yourself, bro. Just go in that direction. That's, the, that's, not the, that's the opposite of the Bible. 
No, we're supposed to listen to the Bible and our flesh pulls us this way and the Bible says, no, you can't do that. You have to go this way. And we make that change. That's the flesh versus the spirit. That's the whole thing. So take the personality test. And you might be like, yeah, these are my tendencies. But if those are fleshly tendencies leading you towards sin against the Bible, that's got to change. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to go through the personalities and we're not going to, if there's like one personality, I'm not going to do a sermon on it because I'm not going to preach an entire sermon against one person, <laughs> even though I'm kind, of, I'm kind of preaching a sermon against myself. <laughs> these last two sermons. I'm reading these, these, uh, these traits and I'm just like, I can't believe I'm reading this out loud right now. That's why my wife cried. She's like, Commander, she's reading it. She's like, ah! It's going to be fine. So we're going to have a series on it. We're going to go through these traits. We're going to look at what the Bible says. And we're going to look at, hey, you know what? This might mean that you want to go in this direction in these types of scenarios. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says you should do this. And I'm going to help you. We're going to have some practical preaching and personalized preaching on this stuff. So Joab. Joab was an unchecked personality. Okay, so if you're an unchecked personality, you say, yeah, but I'm not a commander. It doesn't matter. You could still be an unchecked personality. If you are a executive, I've never seen so many executives in one, in one group of people, by the way. There's like five executives in this church. I have to go study that one. I don't know what that means, if it's good or bad. But I mean, the whole thing is if you're just an unchecked whatever, the disadvantages are really going to hurt you in your life. Those, those, you know, it destroyed Joab. Joab was not listed among the mighty men, even though he was a mighty man. His brother brothers were listed, Uriah was listed, people he murdered, you know, were, were listed, and he wasn't listed. Even though all the victories that he had, everything, it said he was buried alone in the woods, basically. He was buried alone. I mean, where you're buried, think about where you're buried in the Bible. I mean, you read through all the kings, and if he was a, a good king, he was buried with his fathers. He was buried with the kings. You know, Jehoiada, he wasn't even a king, and he was buried with the kings. I mean, that's impressive. Joab, look at all the things that he did. How many military victories do you think this guy won? I mean, he had 10 men to carry his armor. This guy was a warrior, buried by himself in the woods. Unchecked personality. He just, he just lived a selfish life. He just did whatever he wanted for his own agenda. And look, that could be the same for any personality, whether it's even the defenders could have, oh, you defenders think you're so great. You know, even the defenders can have unchecked disadvantages, according to the Bible. And we'll talk about that. That's going to be my first one. I'm just going to rip on defenders. <laughs> it's like three quarters of everyone. And all the good people, they're all defenders. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. But it's, it's a very interesting study. But it just shows that it doesn't matter what your tendencies are. It doesn't matter. Because that's all just, it's all, it, it really, what it really should do is show you your strengths especially younger people, maybe teenagers, to show you your strengths. I mean, I almost guessed a couple of the teenagers what they would be because, you know, it shows, okay, you're very creative. You're very, you know, you're very in tune to things that are not common. You're going to think of out-of-the-box ideas, things like this. Well, that's good to recognize at a young age. Maybe that will help define what you go into or define what you do for a living. Or, you know, ladies, it'll define maybe how you, you know, raise your children. You know, we'll look at that as well. So it can be a lot, it's a big advantage to know more about yourself, but the Bible, it's, it's all of our, it's our common goal together is, is following what this says for us, no matter what our flesh says that we should or shouldn't feel or whatever, okay? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.